Hey there, FBA Millionaires is coming up in about 20 seconds, and it's brought to you by UpFund. You know, one of the biggest mistakes Amazon sellers make is taking out loans with sky-high interest rates that eat up all their cash flow. Don't fall into that trap. If you're looking to borrow money to grow your business, do it the responsible, smart way with UpFund. See how much you qualify for in 30 seconds by going to upfund.io. That's upfund.io. No two products are exactly alike, right? And that can be a very good thing now if yours, your product is better than the competition's. Are you interested in building a better mousetrap? Product design food for thought coming up today from the West Coast to the world. This is FBA Millionaires. Welcome to FBA Millionaires. This is the program that is geared toward helping you pursue your goal of earning a seven-figure income selling professionally on Amazon via fulfillment by Amazon. Hi there, my name is Jeff Allen. So good to check in with you. Really enjoyed doing this program along with my bud. And this program would not be what it is without him. He is in Northern California while I sit here in the Southland. His name is Mr. Will Moffat. Will, how are you, sir? Hey, everybody. I'm wonderful. Um, thanks so much. Uh, it's it's a beautiful day. We have a, a great, awesome guest for you guys, and um, I'm excited to be here again with Jeff. Man, I appreciate that, Will. And our guest is somebody who's uh, very uh, uh, easy to get excited about because she and her husband are involved in helping people uh, bring their ideas to life in terms of the products that they sell or helping them improve one that maybe they're already selling. Tell us a little bit about who our guest is. So we have Tracy here with us, FBA Millionaire. She's awesome. Um, she's done a bunch of cool things with Amazon sellers as far as um, designing, um, I mean, all the way up to getting sellers or just businesses in general into retail stores. I mean, they do a lot of cool things. And I think it's best if Tracy kind of talk about all the different things that her company does and how she can help Amazon sellers. So Tracy, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. Thank you guys so much for having me this morning. Tracy yes, Hazard with her husband, uh, Tom Hazard, co-founded Has Design at HasDesign.com. And Will, uh, props to you, my friend, because you had a chance to meet uh, Tracy at one of the recent events you did. And uh, Tracy, talk about one busy lady. I mean, just some of the things you're involved in. Well, we are involved in, yeah, way too many things, but it is partially because <laughs> the business is exploding. And so that's a good problem to have, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's because there's so many great brands coming up in the world that we're busier than ever. Um, yeah, so has design, my, my partner Tom and I, we've been doing uh, design for mass market retail. So for big box stores, clubs, um, office superstores. We've been doing that on and off for 25 years. And oh I say goodness. on and off because sometimes we were in-house at companies and sometimes we were out. Um, and uh, I cut my teeth on Herman Miller and make, mm. and helping to uh, build and launch the Aeron chair. If you've ever seen that iconic, you know, tech company uh, chair with the mesh material, that's where yeah. I started my 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 you know, launching product world came from there. That and is my chair of choice here in my yeah. office, Tracy. I saw that on your website. It has design.com. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. That's the chair I sit in. I'm in touch with greatness here. <laughs> this is this chair has changed my life because now my my butt doesn't get hot on a summer day sitting in this chair. It's fantastic. That is why the designer designed it. Yep. <laughs> this is amazing. So tell me, so tell me, Tracy. Um, so you and your husband, you've been consulting with big companies, and these are big brands that you've been working with. How did you get involved with consulting with independent Amazon sellers, and, and how do you help Amazon sellers? Well, you know, you have to look at the industry shift over time is that, you know, back when we started 25 plus years ago, right, there were only big brands because it was so costly to get into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. There wasn't an Amazon when we started. And so Amazon came about in 97-ish, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, we were on our own doing something that was totally um, – 
not us designing for others, but actually doing our own product at that time. And so we started an e-commerce store. We were what you would have called the early developer community, like app developers today, but we were creating our own accessories and we were trying to sell them. And what I wouldn't have given to have had an Amazon to help me out through that oh, process boy, yeah. at that time. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, we see Amazon and, and watched its growth over the years and saw this brilliance that um, and logistical savings because to build that part of your company is extremely expensive. And so we saw that happening right under all these big brands noses and they were ignoring it and they were discounting it. And we thought, there's really something here that these digital marketers have tapped into. Now, if we could just shift that a little bit and make it something that American consumers really want to buy, now we've got something amazing. And so we started to just partner up with a couple of Amazon sellers we saw who who would find me because I write articles and I'm on podcasts and it just would happen and they would find me and they would ask if we would do business with them. And, you know, they would assume that they were much too small for us in terms of our fees and all of that. And and in reality, they technically were at the time. But I thought we like to learn here. Let's do a couple of projects that seem fun and see what's there. See if we can really add value. And that's how it got going. And we added some tremendous value and helped a couple of companies get uh, acquired. And so we realized that we were helping to grow bigger brands by applying the principles of what we did for the big brands, but at a smaller scale. You, you know, Tracy, there are so many products out there to choose from for Amazon sellers of all stripes, no matter where they are in the world. And there are more and more of these companies that they can source from to get these products and sell them. And we've seen several of these products online that it seems like uh, there are a number of people that are sharing uh, uh, several slices of the pie. The, a product may look uh, the same uh, that I have in my store that maybe the guy down the street is, is selling, but we're making a lot of money and we're able to get these products cheaply. We just uh, find them, we private label them, we slap our name on them, and we're able to get great quantities at, at a great price. And, and yet, I'm just kind of wondering, isn't it expensive to build that mousetrap, that better mousetrap, when we can just simply go to, to Alibaba or one of these other sourcing companies, get our products, order them and sell them that way? You know, that is a great question. And the reality is, is that it's, it is a great, it's a great option and you should do it. Yeah. You should absolutely do it. But what you're not thinking about is the bigger picture of your brand and your product line when you do that. So when you've got something tracking, when you've done that and it's working, You've got access to a great audience. You've got a buying pace that's really working for you. At that point, what usually happens to you guys? Trolls, come on, you're listing, right? You get other sellers on there. You get counterfeiters. You get all of this. And so when you look at your investment in time and energy in marketing, and now your life cycle of your product is cut short, that's where the Amazon seller in that sort of digital marketing world is looking at it from a less big picture um, vision of building a bigger brand. And so it's right at that stage where that investment that you might need to make in an original product makes sense to have built in. And now you're doing what I call stacking S curves, right? So you sort of built it. And as it's about to decline a little bit, you've got your next product that's already just come up and grown and you're outpacing the competition every single time. And you're keeping your consumers that you've worked so hard to attract m even more attracted and interested in you. And so that's how you're going to maximize the investment you've made. But at the same time, I think that those that create original product, the inventors out there, I'm going to call them, okay, the inventors of the world may have a better mousetrap. They may have a better idea, but they don't have what you guys can do which is attract an audience and confirm that it's right. And so they spend all their money up front, run out of it on the marketing side. I love the model of spending it all up front to make sure and figure out that you've got a marketing. Now you've got a revenue stream from that product that maybe it's not that original, but it's working. And then by the time you get your competition in, you bring in that original product and now you've built a more valuable brand that's not going to go anywhere and that can't be easily competed with. 
Got it. So let me ask you a question. Let's just say my name is Tim, and and right now I am killing it with one product. And I know you were you were saying that we need to be having the second product coming um, to to keep us up to date and fresh. And so let's just say Tim is spending one hundred thousand dollars every two months on inventory because he has a product that's killing it on Amazon. So and he has a great brand on Amazon. What should, what should Tim do? Should Tim focus on building more products on Amazon? Should he focus on leveraging that one product and maybe building a Shopify store? Or should he focus on possibly pitching that to big brands? Should he consider selling it? There's so many options, and I think that's what Amazon sellers, you know, they're focused on the money is coming in from Amazon, right? But they don't see the big picture of how their brand is really killing it and how to leverage this this time of killing it to a bigger picture. Yeah, there was this guy at um, who was up on stage at the Prosper Show where we both were, and it was like a panel discussion, and he's up there bragging about the fact that he has like, you know, 10,000 SKUs or something. And so I asked around because I I wasn't really sure and he didn't state it and wouldn't state it about how big his company was. And so I started asking around and some people said, oh, I know how big he is. I know how many million he's under $10 million. And so I started, you know, so I started doing the math on the average life cycle and looking at his product line. And I go, you know, at the end of the day, his net profit margin is probably somewhere around 800 to a thousand dollars a SKU. And um, when you look at having managed that many SKUs. Now, of course, you've got some really great winners in there and you've got some really losers in there. And right. And that's downing your average. But the most of the Amazon sellers groups, when we do the final analysis and we look at them, some of them are between one and 10 percent prof- net profit margin. And this is, you know, and some of them, it's gross profit margin. They mm-hmm. haven't even paid themselves. Right. <clears throat> Yep. And so when we look at that, we go, that's not a viable and sustainable business. So how are we going to get it to that stage of doing that? And so we have to look at the line in terms of what our goal is. If our goal is just to make a, you know extra pocket change every single month, great. That's the model to go on because it's a whole lot less work, a whole lot less investment, and a whole lot less risk. So go on that model of finding stuff that churns, keep doing that, keep doing what Tim's doing, right? If your goal is to build a bigger brand, if your goal is to get acquired, you've got to give them a reason to acquire you. You've got to give them a reason to come to you and not some one of your other competitors because they're not buying out a single product. They're buying out a line. They're buying out someone who has access to a particular market. So at that stage, Tim should really look at and say, do I have a market niche that's going to be valuable? Can I bring other products, even if I don't do it yet, but can I bring other products, build my Shopify store around a brand messaging and around a community that is going to care? Because we are in a content to commerce world, right? Mm -hmm. That's why you're podcasting. That's why all of this is going, right? (laughs) The free stuff we give out in terms of content translates into more commerce, more business later. And so from that perspective, if you can't, if you t- have to talk all over the place because you've got 10,000 SKUs and some of them are in pet, some of them are in juvenile, some of them are in housewares, they're all over the place, mm-hmm. you don't have a clear picture of your consumer. Demographics don't count. It's psychographics that count, right? What does that consumer want? What do they like? What do they care about? What messaging can I bring them? What great content can I deliver to them, whether it's in video or audio or blog form, Right. How can I get all of that to them so that they want to do more business with me? They want to transact more commerce with me, right? That's our goal. And so when you find that, now that's what you grow, right? And that's the time where you, at some point, have to get to be the only game in town. I call it me-only territory. So you have to get to be the only person who provides something special to them. Now, sometimes it can be a service. Um, So it can be, uh, you know, there are subscription services or I've got a great juvenile company that does toys. And one of the things that they do is they do these great games you can play with the toys. So what they deliver on their site is not product. They deliver the product all through Amazon. But what they deliver through their site is a great add-on to utilizing the toys that they're selling. And so it makes for an audience that is engaged. So whatever it is to get them to buy more to get them to want to spend more time with you, that's what you do. 
That makes total sense. So tell me this, Tracy. Um, as far as dealing with clients, and, and there's different type of Amazon cl clients out there, is there a checklist of attributes or requirements that you that that you require or maybe um, that you would like to see? Uh, some type of, um, I guess, stage that the Amazon seller is in before you will actually work with them as far as seriously um, getting, giving uh, I, the clients ideas and working with them to build their brand. Which stage is it that you think would be best for you to work with them? And and if you say, you know what, I think you have something or you may not have nothing, I can't work with you yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, so... Tom and I are in the uh, hate to leave people behind, right? This is, I mean, this has been a, um, a lifelong observation for me, but also real world. So because we're inventors, because we have patents, because we've had our own business before, we know what it's like to feel isolated and not get insider information. And that to me is a crime. And then to allow those same people to be preyed upon by someone who's selling a course in something that they only have, you know, six months of experience in, have done once, drives me absolutely mm -hmm. insane. Yeah. But at the same time, there's only two of us and there's only so much time in the day. And so I, we've had to really get creative and figure out ways at which we can make sure that we don't leave people behind. And that's why we, pro I produce so much content. Right. I produce a ton of content. I write articles. I we do over 36 blog posts a month um, and podcasts a month um, through all of our channels. Right. To sort of get this information out to people. And I don't want to leave anyone behind at any stage because you could be starting and you could be on to something that could be amazing and the world needs but you're going to take a bunch of wrong turns on your way the longer it takes you to 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 go that full path the less chance of success you have so if i can guide them on the fastest path to success and that's all that i give them and they follow it and then they at some point they go oh i'm ready for you great then i've done my job and i feel great about the that added value I put into the world. If it's really of, I am a growing business, I've got these employees here, I want to keep them employed, I want to grow this company, I want to grow this brand, I want to get it sold, I can help them too. And so I try not to be restrictive about how I help people. I just try to sort of say, it's more of a state of mind. Are you building something bigger? Are you coachable? Because this is a problem. If you're very, we have a lot of inventors who are very closed minded they're all about their thing and they don't want to hear about how much they need to experience the marketing. They say, Oh, my family, my friends, they love my stuff. It's so great. And that's good, but it's not an indicator of whether or not someone's going to plunk down a dollar for your thing. And so we need to find out as fast as possible in the process are, does the, do the dogs eat the dog food? Do women want to buy this? Um, whatever. Do, do kids want to play with it, right? Whatever it might be, we've got to find where that transaction point is going to happen and are they going to do it? And the sooner we can do it before you spend a lot of time, money, and energy, the better off we are. And so anyone who's open to that model of it, I am open to working with. Now, we have all kinds of different ways to work with people where it's you can just – you can literally consume – the 12 people who I refer every single one of my clients to at some point in the process, you can consume content from them. And every single month you can actually get do live Q and A's with them. We built that just because you couldn't, you can't retain these people. You couldn't spend the hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of dollars to retain these people. But if you don't ask them a question early on, like um, if I'm designing my package right now, um, should I put the barcode on it? Should I put these things on it, even though I'm not using one right now? The answer might be, do you have a plan to be on the shelf? If you do, you only want to do this once because otherwise you're going to slow your time down and have to do it again. And it's going to cost you a hundred bucks extra to do it right. So these are the kinds of questions and things that you don't know the right order to, but these people do. I yeah. want to give you access to them. So that's what I, we've built into our process. We've built into our services to be able to make that happen. Um, and then from there, if you really don't know what you want to make, 
You don't know what's next for you. You think you got a brand, but you're not sure. That's the time for a strategy. And that's, they use, I usually do those myself. And then if they're big enough, Tom and I do them together. And then from there, it's a matter of, do you want to do these products? Do you want to design them? Do you need them? And so that's the people we work with. We usually don't come to someone who says, I've got this gadget. Um, will you draw it up for me? We don't work with people like that. Got it. And and so for FBA millionaires out there, um, you know, it's important to have a strategy. Let's just say, OK, I'm launching one product. That product is successful. And now I'm going into, let's just say, pets. Now I've created a eight successful pet products through Amazon where I have recurring sales and then I built my website and then it may be time to go to bigger box stores. It, you know, the, the world is yours to create, but if you have that strategy, especially that exit strategy, you might say after that, okay, I want to sell for eight figures. Um, I, I think nine. That's, yep. The, nine. nine. Oh, there we go. See, tra that's what it's gonna take. Yeah. That I mean, it's going to take getting you to nine to really make significant money to really be so valuable that you ha you must get bought out. That's what happens. So we, we it, it, you're gonna hit a, a getting to a million, uh, I, I'm not gonna say it's easy, cause uh, you know, you all know out there it's not, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But once you've tipped that million point, getting from 1 million to 10 million, you can do that through product, just line expansion, right? If, you, yes. if you're smart about your choices, right? N and not just going anywhere the wind blows you. <laughs> You know, oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. Don't do that. <laughs> but if you're strategic about it, you can get to 10. But getting from 10 to 50 to 100, that's where the growth challenge happens. But it's also where you hit the big box. You hit the big brands right where they notice you. So you're not going to sell to some little company that's going to buy you, pay you barely a variable on your sales. You're going to get a premium for your brand when you hit 100 million. Boy, that's where the rubber meets the the road. And Tracy, you have such a fresh approach and a fresh perspective. We're so pleased to have you as our guest on this program. Tracy Hazard with Tom Hazard. They are the uh, co-founders and co-owners of Has Design. You're listening to our conversation here on FBA Millionaires. Will Moffitt with yours truly, Jeff Allen. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Tracy Hazard right here on FBA Millionaires right after this. Getting the funding you need to grow your business can be challenging, but our friends at UpFund make it super easy. See how much you qualify for in 30 seconds and have your inventory funded in just days. Check out UpFund.io to get started today. That's UpFund.io. Once this show is done, after you finish listening to it, or heck, you can do it even, you know, you're a multitasker, right? Who isn't among us, right? Join the FBA Millionaires Club, and that allows you to stay connected with all that Will and I are doing on the show here. Plus, you'll receive free expert tips and guidance and advice and really to help you take your Amazon business to the highest level possible. And we're not going to provide you with everything that, that we know how to do because we don't know it all, but we'll be able to pro probably provide you, I would imagine, with a couple of hints, tips, and just uh, some suggestions from some of our past FBA Millionaires guests as well. And once again, also, too, with the FBA Millionaires Club, uh, we'll be able to uh, allow you to, uh, to understand a little bit more about maybe upcoming special events, offers, and other benefits. Join the FBA Millionaires Club. You don't have to be a millionaire to join. You just need to have the desire to be that FBA millionaire. And you find out all about it at fbamillionaires.com. Welcome back, Jeff Allen, along with Will Moffat and our guest today, Tracy Hazard. And Tracy, you've sparked my interest here because you've caught me thinking small. And <laughs> when I said eight figures, you replied to me, no, nine figures. And I love it. You're making me up my game. And I think we, get, we all have to up our game. So this is my question for you. What does a nine figure acquisition look like? I mean, what does a business have to do to get acquired for nine figures? It, 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 it's, it's something that that I think we all should know. Yeah, you know, this is what I was saying to you before is that going from a million to 10 million, you you can pretty much do the same thing you're doing. You just have to be really great at it, right? You have to refine it. 
And you have to have a really great core audience that you're you know you're transacting with. So it's a high value audience that is just doing more business with you. And so what? So if you get that whole dialed in, and, and usually you're going to be having diversified up to that point to your Shopify shop, you're on Amazon, you've got a funnel going, maybe you've got subscription services going. So you've got other things in the mix there. So you've diversified and done all the smart marketing things to do. OK, but yep. to get from 10 million to 100 million, your business has to get some significant systems in place. And this is simple in the sense of there are hundreds and thousands of companies that have done this before you. So this is not you need to reinvent everything. This is not utilization of new technology in a way. It's you know, it's fairly straightforward and simple. Basically, you have to get systems in place for product management for managing the whole development of something new from the point you get an idea to vetting that idea to doing market research on that idea you have to systematize that and make it a process that you can rely on and use with indicators that you should move forward or you shouldn't move forward and you just want to run through that and feel that it's a reliable indicator and what you don't want to do is get caught up in the oh but i really like it and you push it through anyway right you want to Treat it like a hard and fast go, no go, because you don't have a lot of time to mess around with. So, yes, you might be able to make something work, but it's way better to table it at that stage and come back to it when your systems are in better place or maybe the market shifted and you're seeing that there's a bigger indicator and you can recycle it, come back around, reevaluate it again. That's my my big thing about it is a lot of people get hung up in their products instead of treating them a little more loosely. They're not your babies, not if you want to get to 100 million because <laughs> you're going to sell them. So they're really not your babies. You're going to sell them off. So so you have to think – you don't want to treat them callously either. They need to be important to your audience. But that's where you're gauging. Are they important to this audience I built, or do I have to, like, shift all of my marketing, switch my messaging, build a new market to grow here? Sometimes you do. We have helped companies who were a furniture company who did TV stands and things like that, and we helped them get into office and chairs, right? It, it's not – it's using the same materials, the same uh, production side of things, right, that none of that changed for them, so they didn't reinvent everything. But it was a new marketplace. And so we were brought in to give them that expertise as quickly as possible. So if you do have to reinvent, get yourself someone who knows what they're doing. But to go from that 10 million to 100 million, so product development systems in place, ways to quickly get and scale up your designs and your new products, consistently get them through the process, evaluation processes along the way to say it's good or it's not good, let's keep it, let's not keep it. The biggest mistake most people make is that they keep their SKUs too long. You keep your inventory too long. Mm -hmm. And so get out of stuff faster is, is one of the rules of a $100 million company. But the other rule of it is you must make a lot more samples than you think you will have to. So now you have to shift your mindset of I'm a sampling and product development company because I've got to go through lots of ideas and vet them because I've got to hit on the ones that – fit the formula of what I know I can sell. And so it doesn't mean you've taken it along and you keep going with it. And so that's why that is different. The other part is you do have to have logistic systems. Maybe you're building that in house, you know, delivery, you're shifting all of those things and all of those components have to start communicating. And that's the difference is normally you have just one person who wears a ton of hats, right? Now you have to get different departments, different divisions, different uh, maybe even systems in place for how you're you're delivering. So you maybe have a, a system that does warehousing and logistics, and maybe you have a system that does product development. you got to get them communicating together. So from a system standpoint, that's where it gets complicated. And again, though, this is something that you can model, that you can bring people in who know what they're doing, who've done it again and again. And you want to bring someone who's done it for a bigger brand, not someone who's done it from an Amazon seller and happened to grow up because typically what happens is they went up, got sold, and they didn't experience that sort of integration pain because what happens if you have to keep going? Mm -hmm. Exactly. It makes total sense. Wow. And so, uh, and just to quickly to add on to that, um, what... What what does a, a say like a big brand say like oh okay you know like it's a pet brand and yeah they see you coming and it's like 
Um, what makes them say, you know what, we have to take them? Is it is, is it they're taking Amazon sales? Is it ta they're taking um, publicity? They're taking share off shelves? It's none of those, actually. None of them. <laughs> really? So the big brands ha are pretty uh, isolated and egotistical. There's no question about it, right? They are in their um, ivory towers. They have big corporations, and they certainly don't want to admit that they're not that they're that some little seller is beating them out, right? Like that they would never admit that internally as an organization. <laughs> so that's not how they look at you, right? But they they there is a practical side to many brands, right? And the practical side is, I need more and more things that my buyer, my big buyer at big box or mass market wants, right? That's their whole job is geared around that. Because think about it this way. I can sell one of um, my office chair at Costco sells for about $20 million a year. So now, granted, it's not mine. I say that that way. I designed it. We designed it, but it's not mine. It belongs to the brand that I designed it for. But <laughs> their chair does about $20 million at mass, at mass market, at club. That chair is also like the older version of it is sold on Amazon, it'd be lucky to do $400,000 a year. So like to them, it's chump change, right? They don't see that as why would they buy a brand that only does, you know, 400,000? It means nothing to them. Yep. And so it, it that's not going to hit them. However, if your brand is transacting at such a great pace and you're in the place where that Costco buyer or that mass market retail buyer is paying attention and that's where you're getting publicity, they're going to sit up and go, why aren't you doing something this innovative? And so now they have to scramble to do it. And so it's way easier for them to go, oh, let's just buy them and bring it in house and that's it. Ah. And so in it. In, in, the whole thing about people wanting people in the big brands knocking you off, there's too many legal systems in place for them to do it on purpose. Now, sometimes it happens because you all are thinking the same things at the same time because the market trends are there. It's not like they have special access or you have special access, right? It's not, there's no, there's no garnering the market on, on innovative thinking, right? It happens to everybody and it can happen simultaneously because market indicators are there. So, but they're not out there looking to steal your idea, but they would just rather buy it. It's faster because you already have a market share. You've already got your things going. If you're doing everything right, it's a whole lot faster for them to just do that, bring you in and present you as a part of their brand to the buyer. They'll be ready in less than six months. That's way faster than they can move on their product development. Because remember, they have systems and process in place now. You don't, you're a little more agile. Tracy, yes. this is eye-opening stuff. I mean, it's really, really huge that we're here talking with you about this. And I know that some of these uh, concepts and ideas and the questions we're asking are probably a little bit more um, kind of uh, down the road in terms of, you know, how we're looking. We're looking to our future. You know, we want to be a, a big, we want to be able to have that nine-figure organization that, you know, eventually, and I think we should all kind of keep our eyes on the prize that we want to build a business that we can sell. That's what we want to do. I think that's what I think, ideally, that's what we would all like to do so that that way we can enjoy the fruits of all of our labors uh, somewhere down the line. But let's suppose, let's suppose we're just kind of starting out, okay? And so we're talking from that, that little guy or little gal's perspective. And we've got, um, you know, we want to create our own new product. And one of those products, uh, product lines that have really caught fire the last five years or so, uh, uh, diffusers. Everybody knows what these things are, and there's millions of them. But we want to create our own diffuser. It's something we're very passionate about. For example, how do we get started? I mean, what questions should we ask in order uh, for a, a company like yours, for, for Has Design, to help us design and build that great diffuser that everybody is going to want? That, that's a great question uh, because, you know, we have a mantra here that hope is not a plan. And so if you're going through this and you're like, oh, hope I'm going to make a big brand, right? <laughs> you're just, <laughs> I'm hoping it's going to be fantastic. I'm hoping someone's going to want to acquire me. It doesn't work like that. You have to plan that in. It's got to be embedded into everything you do, every reason you choose a product, every time you look at a product and go, I've got to add something extra to this that is going to make me me only and make me acquirable. How am I going to do that? So these are questions that you have to have to ask. It doesn't always work that every time I look at a product, I go, yeah, there's a really good path there. Sometimes there's not. Yeah. Sometimes you shouldn't do something. And so the difference is, is that you Amazon sellers have come out of a world of 
analytics. So you come out of this analysis of, um, do I think all the indicators are right that I could rank on this item? Do I think all the indicators are right that there's interest in it, that it's in a growth mode? Like you have, are Google AdWords tracking? Like, you know, you're looking at and you have a lot of data. But what you don't have is a bigger picture of what's out on the market and how it works outside of Amazon. And so that's the difference to how we evaluate and look at something because we're always looking at it. If you're going to spend the time and money to make something original, it better work at mass market because you need it to last that long to recoup your investment. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we're always looking at it is, is it added value? So most people go into a startup, like thinking about a new product and they go in what they call the MVP, minimum viable product. You've heard this before. It's a very software term, right? A minimum viable product, that's what they wanna make. Your minimum viable product is the existing product you bought on Alibaba and put your logo on. That's minimum viable. So what we need to move to is maximum valuable product. And it has to be maximum valuable with the audience you intend to grow. And with the audience that you know will be there if you get to, to nine figures, right? When you get to nine figures, it's going to be there because they're also selling at mass market or they're also buying at mass market, right? So you want to make sure that it's valuable for them and it's going to carry through so that that it it can't miss being on the shelf someday that they're going to demand it. They're going to want it. So looking at that, that's how we look at a product is we look at it and we go, OK, is this really on a growth trend or are we in a short life cycle on a product? And it can be that it's a short life cycle. We can see because we study what's in the stores we study what's going in and out. And so when things aren't transacting in stores, they will not come back to it, even if it was just before its time. Buyers will not get burned. <laughs> so <laughs> so you, something that's totally great won't get back in until it's like killed it in an e-commerce somewhere and they can't disregard it anymore. Or a new buyer comes in and they were totally naive to all the history of it. Like that's how it happens. So you can't sell them something that they already sold that they failed on. And so you got to look at that too. You've got to know what went out, what didn't do well, what got closed out. And so having that view of what's in the stores is very, very different. And this is where us U.S. consumers have an advantage over our the factory directs from anywhere in the world. Why? Because we can walk into stores. We can survey them. We can use tools that are out on the marketplace with actual shoppers. My favorite tool, I, I cite it all the time, field agent. Love field agent because they make people be actually in the store in the region you care about. So if you care about the Southwest, they will make sure that their demographic is standing there in the store geolocated so that you do know they really are from there and you're not just getting some random people who joined a survey. Tracy, let me jump in. I, you know, we've got just a little bit of time left here on the show. And I, you know, everything you're talking about here is really, really important. But sometimes I think that, you know, I am a little bit too close to maybe my products or maybe the products that I like. I know why I like those products. I know why, why I buy something that maybe somebody else doesn't. And I keep going back to that product again and again. But for those of us Amazon sellers who are looking to, uh, to get a, a leg up and to have a better understanding of what makes it truly does make a a great product and one that we should have in our own stores with product design. What are the elements of a likable brand? It's something that I can take and keep in my head for, for future that I can refer to. What are those things that, that pop up and stand out to you and Tom and the people you work with that make brands truly things that we like and we need to have? That's the, you know, multi-million dollar question always all the time. <laughs> it's like, you know, and it's different every single time. But but deciding whether or not you, you should do something is the, the number one criteria for us is does it transact with women? And because women buyer control 86 percent of the consumer market. They certainly in, do in my in household. A hundred percent, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Same here. Right. And it doesn't matter whether it's automotive. I mean, like, you know, there isn't a single category that's immune to that statistic. There are very few things. Now, services are different, but consumer products women buyer control the majority of the marketplace. And so when you look at that, if your item is not if you do not have in your store uh, over 70% women, if that's not your consumer base, 
then you actually are not as profitable or valuable as you should be. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing is, is that going to transact there? Is it already transacting there? And can I do more with women, with the products that are doing well with women? So that's a criteria right there. And so that's our number one place where we add a lot of value because there are honestly very few women designers in this world. And there are, if you've ever been in any of your factories that are producing things in China or in other places, in the 20, uh, 15 to 20 years that Tom and I have been going there, we've never seen a female designer in any one of those factories. Oh, wow. So it's a huge advantage to be to tap into something that you know is going to work with women and that women want. So that right there is just an, an easy play in terms of judgment call about whether or not you should move forward on something or grow a, uh, in an area of your program. So that that's it. But on the design side of things, you know, we want something that is self-explanatory. And that's the thing. If I have to explain how it works, then it will never make it at mass market. No one is there at Best Buy to sell stuff. No one is there at Target helping you. If they do, they don't even know what to say. They're like barely know where things are, right? You've been in the stores. <laughs> you know what it's like, right? <laughs> so if it doesn't sell itself off the shelf, if it requires you to do a fancy video and a funnel to get it to sell, it's probably not a growth brand idea. And so that's where design, great design comes in in terms of making sure that that it's tapping into something that's new and innovative, but not something that's so new that I don't know how to use it and I'm afraid to buy it or I don't want, because if I have to learn how to do something, it's going to take me a lot longer to, to decide to buy it from you. And so anything that we can do that just has one foot in innovation and one foot in what I know today. Think of it like when, if you're developing a Shopify shop, right? Shopify is great because the user interface isn't reinvented every time. I know how to shop when I'm in your store, right? And so they didn't make it difficult for me. And so that's the same thing you want to do on the product design side of things. You're thinking about making it easy for the consumer to comprehend. So those are the basic things. Everything else is up to the brand messaging, the audience you're talking to, and making sure that it resonates with them and, and checking it. Like there's a, always a check process in what we do. Just because you like it, because I like it, doesn't mean it's going to sell. Yep. Makes total sense. Wow. Well, okay. This is amazing. And we've had a lot of value come from you, Tracy. Um, I've learned a lot. And I'm sure Jeff learned Amen a lot. To and that. I know the you NBA bet. millionaires out there, they've learned a lot to take their business to the next level, that nine figure level. And that's what we're shooting for. So um, I I would like to just say thank you. And if you could share um, just um, how can FBA millionaires out there engage with you or reach out to you and Tom um, if they would like to uh, collaborate or um, get your services, how can they reach you? Well, you can, of course, reach us on our website, Has Design, and that's Has with two Zs. <laughs> and because Hazard has two Zs, we're, that, we're, we're like that name. But I, we also have a podcast out there called Product Launch Hazards, again, with two Zs. And Product Launch Hazards, we have a free one and a premium one. And the free one has over 50 episodes that talk in deep dive on a lot of these details and also introduce you to some of those experts I told you about. So it's amazing how... Um, how just hearing what someone else has to say re can reinforce the vision that you have. And all of them are very, very accessible um, at productlaunchhazards.com. And so you can, you can access them. You can ask them questions. That's exactly how you can reach me. You can book a time with me. I, I love to talk to people about their business brands and their growth plans and where they're going. So don't be afraid. Reach out. So, and yeah, then I'll I also have um, a coupon offer for your members. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's FBAM18, and I'll send you over the details. But basically, if they join us members, it's $100 off. Oh, sure, that yes, is really, be awesome. really nice. Tremendous. Very, very good, Tracy. That's terrific. We hope that you'll be willing to join us again at some point and maybe even bring Tom. I know who's very, very busy at this point in time. He's not able to join us today, but maybe we can have you both on the program uh, the next time. Again, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us on our program. Thank you both. I enjoyed it. <laughs> thanks so much, Tracy. You're awesome.
And that's going to put the wraps on another edition of FBA Millionaires. And once again, our thanks to Tracy Hazard and she and her husband, Tom, of course, owners of Has Design. Do check it out at hasdesign.com. And check out fbamillionaires.com to join the FBA Millionaires Club. Make sure that in addition to doing that, if you're able to, hop on over to iTunes. If you're not already aware, our show does show up there. Give us a rating. Let us know what we're doing. Let us know how much you enjoy the show or what it is that you'd like us to do maybe a better job of so that we can help you uh, take that next giant step in your FBA millionaire's career that is on your way to becoming the FBA millionaire that we'd love you to be. For Will Moffat in Northern California, I'm Jeff Allen here in Southern California. We're looking forward to talking to you again on our next edition of FBA Millionaires. Until then, let's kill it. Let's kill it.